Dr. Murphy Business and Financial Services, we're here to walk you through the process of buying your very first business. Now today we're going to be looking at specifically four areas, the first being understanding the local economy, then we're going to review a little bit about the process of buying a business, help you understand some common mistakes, and finally we're going to wrap up with how to use a business broker. Now taking a look at the local economy, we see that this study done by BMO Harris Bank, published in the Jacksonville Business Journal, shows that 96% of businesses are expecting themselves to grow or to be stable this year. 92% expect the Florida economy to be stable or improve, and 80% expect the U.S. economy. What we're seeing overall is, is business owners feeling much more confident about the economic outlook. So now let's, let's look at the buying business buying environment. When looking at a business, you want to get an idea whether it's a buyer's market or a seller's market. And currently we have mixed markets. We have markets that are both buyer's markets and seller's markets. Currently our interest rates are very low, which is favorable for the purchase of a business. And with the baby boomers retiring, we have a steady flow of new businesses selling right now. For right now, we have good, well-organized, profitable businesses are selling faster and for a higher rate. So as a buyer, you want to be prepared to move quickly when you find the right business. The buying process is very straightforward. It starts with the determining your buying ability, searching for the right business, signing a non-disclosure, reviewing the memo or the profile of the business, meeting the seller, making an offer, going through due diligence to verify your information, and then of course closing the deal. Let's start with looking at your buying ability. Very much like when you went to buy a home, you looked at how much can I, how much can I afford, the same is true with a business. You want to pre-qualify first. And this can simply be done by meeting with a business broker or meeting with a banking professional and finding out three specific areas of expectations. One is how much cash you have, and this is your down payment. You could get cash from friends and family. You can also roll over a 401k plan. We have several companies like Benetrans or Guidant that does that. Now in the second, you want to look at your bank financing and non-conventional loans and see what financing may be available. And third, you want to consider how much would you be asking a seller to hold in financing as well. Now financing options, you really have two main options. You have bank lending and then you have the seller financing where the seller acts as a bank. When we have bank lending, our most common is what's called SBA guaranteed. This is, these are business loans guaranteed by the Small Business Association. And for this, both the business and the buyer must qualify for the lending. Now, of course, it's obvious that the buyer must qualify, but the business must qualify as well. The business must generate enough cash in order to cover the debt ratio. In other words, the business must be able to pay for its loan. When businesses are qualified, typically the lender will give up to 80%, with the seller holding a note for 10%, and the buyer bringing 10% to closing as well as any additional costs. Now it is important to remember that when you use bank lending it's going to be about 60 to 90 days before you can close. There's a lot of paperwork to be done here and it really should you really should start researching this long before you have an offer in place and it's not available for all buyers or all businesses. Now the second form of lending is seller financing. And this is important because some industries are not financeable with banks. For example, cash-based industries, restaurants, some bars, they're not, there's no financing available for them. So these may not be, uh, there may be little options. And of course, in this scenario, the seller's acting as a bank. And as a bank, they may be asking for credit uh, reports. They may be asking for um, second loans or second position on any assets that you might have. Uh, and again, on the price, the seller may ask a higher price if you're asking them to carry the seller financing. And of course, also as a bank, the seller may charge you interest as well. So now that we have our financing in order and we've got an idea of approximately how much we can spend, we want to start searching for the right business. And there's many places that you can look for businesses. Of course, there's online websites like BizBuySell, there's Craigslist, 
Uh, you can ask friends. You can even check our website out, sellyourbusinessflorida.com, for direct information on where to search for website for businesses for sale. But I want to caution you, if you do approach sellers directly, what may very well happen is the seller doesn't know a process. Most sellers are first-time sellers as well. And so oftentimes they don't know, they don't have a process for selling the business. So it's best to really work with a business broker who can guide you through the process and make sure that you're doing all the things you need to do so that you can minimize your risk in the purchase of a business. Now, of course, you want to keep this confidential. That is very, very important. Anytime a business is for sale, it is highly confidential. And asking for the business's name or location before signing an NDA often will not be provided because it's very important that the employees, the vendors, and the customers do not know the business is for sale. And sometimes competitors will try to find out if their uh, comp other competitors are for sale, and this will wreak havoc on the business. So it's important for us as brokers, we do keep everything confidential. So understand if a broker does ask you to sign a non-disclosure or if a seller asks you to sign a non-disclosure, that is a very common part of our process. And the non-disclosure simply states that you're not going to share any specific information about the business to anybody who has not signed a non-disclosure. That includes family members such as wives, sisters, brothers, aunts, uncles, anybody who has not signed a non-disclosure. And again, this is to protect the integrity of the business because if this is a business you're going to purchase, you wouldn't want the customers leaving, the employees quitting, and the vendors shutting down lines of credit. Now there are three steps to evaluating a business and we're going to walk through each of these. First is looking at its cash flow, second is analyzing your talents and skills, and third is reviewing the opportunity that that business presents. So let's start with the cash flow requirements. Cash flow requirements, is, these are also called seller's discretionary earnings. And what this really is, is the amount of cash or profit that the business is generating. Sometimes you'll hear it called owner's benefit or adjusted net. It has multiple names, but what it really comes down to is the profit of the business, adding back the owner's salary, any personal expenses the owner runs through the business, any one-time expenses that are not typical, and any adjustments to normalize the current situation. And when I say adjustments to normalize, say for example, we had a restaurant and the father of the owner happened to own that shopping center and he was giving his son a very favorable rent rate. Well, when the new owner came in, he would not be paying that favorable rent. He would be paying fair market. So it's important for us that we do normalize that for the new, for the new buyer so that you know what to expect with your expenses. Now, I do want to remind you that, of course, owning a business does give you the benefit of being able to write off some personal expenses, so it'd be unrealistic to expect all of this in cash. But if you were the buyer that was looking to replace a career or perhaps a job, you would be looking at what you currently make and say it was 75000 a year, and you would want to be looking at businesses that generate somewhere in the $75,000 a year or higher range. And it's important that you do understand that. Now also do keep in mind that in valuing a business, the value of the business is based on the cash flow. We're going to look at that here next. So when we look at biz buy sell, you'll see here that the cash flow is highlighted. This one is a catering business and it happens to have a cash flow of $83,000. Next, let's look at the value of a business and this is tightly linked to its cash flow. Truly the value of anything is what a willing, able buyer is willing to pay. That's truly the value of anything. But for businesses, we have a common valuation method. And that's typically either based on a multiplier of cash flow, and we usually see a multiplier of the range of one to three. So say for example, if a business has a cash flow of 100,000, we may say the based on the industry that it's in, its multiplier is two, so it's a $200,000 business. Or we may say, oh, it's a multiplier of three, it's a $300,000 business. It's based on the multiplier of cash flow. The second way we value a business is if its cash flow is not strong. So in other words, if the business may not be making money or the cash flow is less, uh, is very low, it may be just based on its tangible assets. Say, for example, a restaurant that's losing money, 
uh, really doesn't have a value based on cash flow, but it does have tangible assets such as the chairs, the kitchen equipment, the bar, uh, the plates, the dishes, all those are tangible asset values. So we look at a business and value it on one of two of those ways. And then of course, depending on the type of business, we may add back its inventory. We will always add back its real estate, that is separate. And of course, there may be some other adjustments that are made as well. And the second area you want to be evaluating is your talents and skills compared to the business operations requirements. Say for example you were to buy a business where the owner did a lot of marketing and you had no skills in marketing. That business may not flourish as much as it did under the old owner. So it's important to evaluate what does the current owner do and what skill set are you bringing to the table. Ideally, as a new buyer, you want to be evaluating yourself and saying, what is it that I could bring to this business that could make it more successful? Is it your relationships? Is it your contacts? Is it your ability or your talents? And if you can find areas where your strengths as a buyer would bring that business to a next level, not only are you going to have a strong, successful business, but more than likely that business is going to continue to grow and flourish under you more so than another buyer. Now the third step in evaluating a business is evaluating the specific opportunity and its location. And what I mean about that is really looking at the specifics of the business. So here's some questions to think about when evaluating a business. It could be things like what differentiates your business from others? How would you grow the business? And what would you do if the business got a huge windfall of cash? And of course the biggest question that most sellers want to know is why are you selling? Now knowing, asking the question why are you selling, the, the fear of most buyers is that they lost, the business lost a large account or that maybe a key employee left. But the truth is the number one reason why business owners sell is they're burned out. They've just been doing it for too long, they're tired, they're ready for something different. The average time frame for a business owner uh, the, the most common time frame for a business owner to want to sell is after 10 years. So somewhere around the 7 to 10 year range is where we see a lot of business owners starting to say, I'm just ready to do something else. Of course, retirement is also in there, divorce, dispute or illness, insufficient capital, um, liquidity, outside investors want liquidity or estate liquidity, or sometimes they just get an offer. And that's why they sell. But it's important to understand that the most of the reasons why a business owner is looking to sell has nothing to do with the business. And it has everything to do with their personal situation. Once you've signed your non-disclosure, then it becomes, then you get all the information about the business. And this is often include the name, the location, uh, financials about the business, uh, sometimes forecasted financial synopsis of contracts, leases, lawsuits, and this really is given to the select few prospective buyers that are qualified. And qualified can often mean many things. It can mean that they have the right experience, that they have the right financials, and that they possess the right skill set as well. Now personally, my partner and I, for every business we list, we do go ahead and write a memorandum. We believe that it helps you as a buyer to better understand that business by profiling the ins and outs of that business. So once you've reviewed the memo and you've qualified with the seller and you've evaluated the business and it meets your needs, the next step really is meeting with the seller. And the purpose of this meeting is to really learn about the business and understand the seller. At this meeting, it's you really want to ask questions about the business. Find out as much as you can at this point. Take a tour of the facility, take a look at the inventory, and these are really C-level questions. This meeting isn't, isn't designed at all for negotiations. It's really not designed uh, to inspect financials. It's really a getting to know the owner meeting. And once you've gotten to know the owner, you understand the business, it makes sense, now's the time to really consider making an offer. And there are several things you want to consider when making an offer. First is the price. What price are you going to offer on the business? Is it going to be full price or is it going to be so much down and then you pay over a certain period of time? Is it going to be an earn out, which means that the price is based on the performance of the business? Are you going to ask for seller financing? What type of non-compete terms are you going to ask for? And this is where you tell the seller they can't compete or start in that same industry again. 
How much of a training period are you going to ask for? Uh, are you going to hold money in escrow? And this is very common if it's a full cash purchase. Um, what contingencies are you going to write into the contract? When making an offer, you may need to have a contingency written in if you can't get your financing that you have the right to back out or if you can't get an appropriate lease with a landlord or franchise or approval. These are all things to consider when making an, an offer. And as you work with a broker, these are things we work with on a daily basis so we can guide you through this process. Now, of course, we're going to encourage you to have an attorney review all your contracts and to make sure that everything is protecting you. Of course, once the offer is accepted, the next step is going into due diligence. And due diligence, now is the time that you can ask for pretty much any information that the, bot that the seller has. The goal of due diligence is to reduce your risk and to verify all the information you've been given in the offering memorandum. And here you want to create a priority of what to ask for. You want to be careful not, not asking for things that, that really don't pertain, but things that are just more interesting versus required. Because there's a lot of information to learn about a business. And oftentimes due diligence, we want to keep it a short period of time. And we'll talk about that in a minute. During this period, you want to be using outside advisors, so your attorney, your accountant. You may even have specialists that you bring in, such as those to check the software on the computers to make sure they're all valid. So this is the time really to inspect the business and make sure you're getting what you think you're buying. Now, confidentiality is critical at every stage of this sale, and it becomes harder and harder to maintain when we're going into due diligence because you're often in the business, you're looking at books, you're requesting lots of documents, you're asking for verification, and this is a time when it, it can easily get alerted to the employees that something's going on. So we want to keep due diligence to as short a time as possible. And this really comes down to the type of business that you're purchasing. The bigger the business, the more relative the, the, the word short is. Of course, the smaller the business, the easier it is to say a week or two, uh, but certainly the larger businesses do take longer for due diligence. Again, you want to finish your document reviews and make sure that your financials are in place and that you've signed off on your financial contingencies before contacting suppliers, customers, and bankers, as well as leaseholders. Oftentimes, we want to make sure that everything is good before we alert third parties. Now, once due diligence is completed, you may have to do some negotiating, and there may be some items that were found that were unsuspected, or and you may have to add some addendums, you may have some additional agreements that you want added, and that's all acceptable, and that's all a very normal part of the process. Many times, buyers think that once the contract's set, they have to try to get everything in there in the first time. Well, yeah, it's good to get as much in there as possible, but there are certain things that you won't know until you start doing due diligence, and you may find some things that you go, I really need to change that in our contract. And as long as you and the seller agree, you add an, ad add an addendum, and it gets added into the final closing package. And again, as we go through this process, it's important to stay positive and stay flexible. Remember, no business is perfect. There's no business that is absolutely perfectly run without any challenges. So you want to be realistic and reasonable with your expectations. As a new buyer, it's easy to get spooked when a business has a hiccup, but that's normal. All businesses have hiccups. The question is how big is it and how important is it to, for you moving forward? Now, once you've closed on the business, you've purchased it, now it's time to take a look at a few items. One is your indemnifications. Make sure that you bought what you think you bought. It. You bought. There's representations and warranties often in your contracts. Now you want to work out your earnouts. Did you agree that as long as the business keeps doing a certain number, you're going to pay a certain amount? Now's the time that you're going to be paying on those. And of course, you're going to have a transition period. This is where you want to make sure to play nicely. The seller certainly may still be under some stress. Employees may be stressful. You want to have a smooth transition through this period. Now, in order to help you buy your first business, let me expose a few of the most common buyer mistakes. First is overlooking the talent requirements. And what I mean by that is when you buy a business, that business has certain needs that the current seller is providing. You've got to make sure that you can provide that. And let me give you an example. I had a couple that bought a business, and the business had a need for someone to run it who could manage teams. That was one of the requirements. The new buyers really didn't have that ability, and what happened was even though 
they were able to run the business they were unhappy with the business and only a few years later ended up selling it significantly less than what they paid for it so I want to help you as a new buyer carefully evaluate what type of personality what type of requirements what type of skill does this business require and you'll find that out by asking the seller many of the questions about what they do on a day-to-day -day basis the second part is incomplete due diligence this often happens and frequently happens when a buyer does not engage a business broker I recently talked to a gentleman who bought a flooring company and he made the mistake of making it an a, a stock sale instead of an asset sale and after he bought the business he only found out that the business had a hundred thousand dollar loan attached to it that he had just purchased on top of the business three years later when I contacted him he was almost bankrupt and had had lost his entire life savings because of incomplete due diligence I also recently had someone that decided she didn't want a broker involved decided to go to the seller herself purchased the business without a broker and then later found out that the business had fifty five thousand dollars worth of UCC liens attached to it so it's very important that you do your due diligence and a good attorney a good broker and a good accountant will will pay off dividends in helping you to get through this process the next common mistake is the gotta do this deal mentality and that's when we get we fall in love with the business for emotional reasons versus financial and let me give you an example of this I have a very good friend who loves his dance school and he saw this dance school he fell in love with it and I've been asking him for the financials and he's already agreed on a price he doesn't even know the numbers he doesn't know if he's gonna have to step in day one and start pumping in two three four five ten thousand dollars a month to keep it afloat or whether it's gonna make him any money but he fell in love with the idea of owning a dance studio without understanding the numbers of a dance studio so that's another common mistake the last two is overpaying and that comes down to not knowing what the business is worth and taking on too much debt and then the last one is undercapitalized if all you have is fifty thousand dollars and you want to start a restaurant you're gonna find that quickly fifty thousand dollars does not buy you enough to run a restaurant and it, when you're undercapitalized you end up squeezing out marketing you don't do the things you're supposed to do you end up not making payroll before you know it you bankrupt a business so you want to look at all of these situ all of these areas and make sure that you're making a good good decision and certainly a well-trained broker can help you through that process so let's talk about using a broker many times we hear buyers say well I'm just gonna call whoever's on the listing or I'm just gonna call every broker in town and have them work with me well, let me share with you that may not be your best strategy and the reason why is when you talk to many brokers nobody has nobody's looking out for you and you really don't have a focus you're just talking to this person this person this person this person and you have to keep retelling your story nobody's really looking for you and honestly if you talk to every broker a word eventually gets around and some brokers they just simply won't work with you because they feel there's no loyalty whatsoever so it's important that you really do just choose one broker that you like that you can work with that can help you to find the right business this creates focus because that broker can say well we looked at this and you like this so this one's very similar and oftentimes as brokers we have information on businesses that are considering selling long before they ever hit the market we have more access to people selling businesses than a buyer could ever find and so we get to know you we know what your wants are we know what your needs are and because we list them we often know where the good ones are first long before you'll ever see them so we can get you we can help you to see the insights to those early listings now working with a broker there's a few things you're gonna be asked to do first you're gonna have to qualify and that means completing an intake interview we want to know who you are we want to know what's important to you we want to know what your needs are what your financial requirements are we're gonna ask you for financial profile we're gonna ask you to provide us a resume especially if you're looking at the higher price businesses we want to make sure that you make a good decision we we want to help you through that process so we help you to pre-qualify for purchases we'll introduce you to various bankers as required we've got options to funding that you may not know about also we're going to ask you to complete your non-disclosures in a timely fashion if you request information on a business we send you the non-disclosure make sure to get it back to us and then of course we're going to ask you for feedback on each business that you've evaluated and to be able to work with a broker those are the basic requirements that we're looking for now why would you use Murphy well specifically 
we have the highest level of professionalism in the industry. You'll find with many brokers, you make a phone call and they may or may not call you back. With us, whether it's myself or my partner, Bill Yankee, we're going to call you back usually within that same day, but typically within hours or minutes of you calling us. Everything we do is highly confidential. We leverage our dedicated networks of brokers to find quality listings. Here at Murphy, we've got 200 plus brokers all over the United States and Canada that are always coming up with new opportunities. So depending on whether you're looking in Florida or you're looking anywhere in the United States, we can help you to find the right, the right business. Now lastly, if you're looking to search for a business, feel free to check out our website. Uh, here's the short link to searching for businesses on our website. And if you're ready to start looking for your first business, look, go ahead and contact us directly for your intake interview. And again, my name's Kimberly Deese with my partner Bill Yankee. We're business brokers at Murphy Business and Financial Services.